Introduction to Memories of Childhood's Slavery Days by Annie L. Burton, published 1909. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry. Memories of Childhood's Slavery Days by Annie L. Burton. Chapter 1 recollections of a happy life the memory of my happy carefree childhood days on the plantation with my little white and black companions is often with me neither master nor mistress nor neighbors had time to bestow a thought upon us for the great civil war was raging that great event in american history was a matter wholly outside the realm of our childish interests of course we heard our elders discuss the various events of the great struggle but it meant nothing to us on the plantation there were ten white children and fourteen colored children our days were spent roaming about from plantation to plantation not knowing or caring what things were going on in the great world outside our little realm planting time and harvest time were happy days for us how often at the harvest time the planters discovered corn stalks missing from the ends of the rows and blame the crows we were called the little fairy devils to the sweet potatoes and peanuts and sugar-cane we also helped ourselves those slaves that were not married served the food from the great house and about half past eleven they would send the older children with food to the workers in the field of course i followed and before we got to the fields we had eaten the food nearly all up when the workers returned home they complained and we were whipped the slaves got their allowance every monday night of molasses meat cornmeal and the kind of flour called dredgings or shorts perhaps this allowance would be gone before the next monday night in which case the slaves would steal hogs and chickens then would come the whipping post master himself never whipped his slaves this was left to the overseer we children had no supper and only a little piece of bread or something of the kind in the morning our dishes consisted of one wooden bowl and oyster shells were our spoons this bowl served for about fifteen children and often the dogs and the ducks and the peafowl had a dip in it sometimes we had buttermilk and bread in our bowl sometimes greens or bones our clothes were little homespun cotton slips with short sleeves i never knew what shoes were until i got big enough to earn them myself if a slave man or woman wished to marry a party would be arranged some saturday night among the slaves the marriage ceremony consisted of a pair jumping over a stick if no children were born within a year or so the wife was sold at new year's if there was any debt or mortgage on the plantation the extra slaves were taken to clayton and sold at the courthouse in this way families were separated when they were getting recruits for the war we were allowed to go to clayton to see the soldiers i remember at the beginning of the war two colored men were hung in clayton one caesar king for killing a bloodhound and biting off an overseer's ear the other dabney madison for the murder of his master dabney madison's master was really shot by a man named houston who was infatuated with madison's mistress and who had hired madison to make the bullets for him houston escaped after the deed and the blame fell on dabney madison as he was the only slave of his master and mistress the clothes of the two victims were hung on two pine trees and no colored person would touch them since i have grown up i have seen the skeleton of one of these men in the office of a doctor in clayton after the men were hung the bones were put in an old deserted house somebody that cared for the bones used to put them in the sun in bright weather and back in the house when it rained finally the bones disappeared although the boxes that had contained them still remained at one time when they were building barns on the plantation one of the big boys got a little brandy and gave us children all a drink enough to make us drunk four doctors were sent for but nobody could tell what was the matter with us except they thought we had eaten something poisonous they wanted to give us some castor oil but we refused to take it because we thought that the oil was made from the bones of the dead men we had seen finally we were told about the big white boy giving us the brandy and the mystery was cleared up young as i was then i remember this conversation between master and mistress on master's return from the gate one day when he had received the latest news william what is the news from the seat of war a great battle was fought at bull run and the confederates won he replied oh good good said mistress and what did jeff davis say 
look out for the blockade i do not know what the end may be soon he answered what does jeff davis mean by that she asked sarah ann i don't know unless he means that the niggers will all be free oh my god what shall we do i presume he said we shall have to put our boys to work and hire help but she said what will the niggers do if they are free why they will starve if we don't keep them oh well he said let them wander if they will not stay with their owners i don't doubt that many owners have been good to their slaves and they would rather remain with their owners than wander about without home or country my mistress often told me that my father was a planter who owned a plantation about two miles from ours he was a white man born in liverpool england he died in louisville alabama in the year eighteen seventy five i will venture to say that i only saw my father a dozen times when i was about four years old and those times i saw him only from a distance as he was driving by the great house of our plantation whenever my mistress saw him going by she would take me by the hand and run out upon the piazza and exclaim stop there i say don't you want to see and speak to and caress your darling child she often speaks of you and wants to embrace her dear father see what a bright and beautiful daughter she is a perfect picture of yourself well i declare you are an affectionate father i well remember that whenever my mistress would speak thus and upbraid him he would whip up his horse and get out of sight and hearing as quickly as possible my mistress's action was of course intended to humble and shame my father i never spoke to him and cannot remember that he ever noticed me or in any way acknowledged me as his child my mother and my mistress were children together and grew up to be mothers together my mother was the cook in my mistress's household one morning when master had gone to euphalia my mother and my mistress got into an argument the consequence of which was that my mother was whipped for the first time in her life whereupon my mother refused to do any more work and ran away from the plantation for three years we did not see her again our plantation was one of several thousand acres comprising large level fields upland and considerable forests of the southern pine cotton corn sweet potatoes sugar-cane wheat and rye were the principal crops raised on our plantation it was situated near the p river and about twenty-three miles from clayton alabama one day my master heard that the yankees were coming our way and he immediately made preparations to get his goods and valuables out of their reach the big six-mule team was brought to the smokehouse door and loaded with hams and provisions after being loaded the team was put in the care of two of the most trustworthy and valuable slaves that my master owned and driven away it was master's intention to have these things taken to the swamp and there concealed in a pit that had recently been made for the purpose but just before the team left the main road for the by road that led to the swamp the two slaves were surprised by the yankees who at once took possession of the provisions and started the team toward clayton where the yankees had headquarters the road to clayton ran past our plantation one of the slave girls happened to look up the road and saw the yankees coming and gave warning whereupon my master left unceremoniously for the woods and remained concealed there for five days the niggers had run away whenever they got a chance but now it was masters and the other white folks turned to run the yankees rode up to the piazza of the great house and inquired who owned the plantation they gave orders that nothing must be touched or taken away as they intended to return shortly and take possession my mistress and the slaves watched for their return day and night for more than a week but the yankees did not come back one morning in april eighteen sixty five my master got the news that the yankees had left mobile bay and crossed the confederate lines and that the emancipation proclamation had been signed by president lincoln mistress suggested that the slaves should not be told of their freedom but master said he would tell them because they would soon find it out even if he did not tell them mistress however said she could keep my mother's three children for my mother had now been gone so long all the slaves left the plantation upon the news of their freedom except those who were feeble or sickly with the help of these the crops were gathered my mistress and her daughters had to go to the kitchen and to the wash tub my little half-brother henry and myself had to gather chips and help all we could my sister caroline who was twelve years old could help in the kitchen after the war the yankees took all the good mules and horses from the plantation and left their old army stock we children chanced to come across one of the yankees old horses that had a u s branded on him 
we called him old yank and got him fattened up one day in august six of us children took old yank and went away back on the plantation for watermelons coming home we thought we would make the old horse trot when old yank commenced to trot our big melons dropped off but we couldn't stop the horse for some time finally one of the big boys went back and got some more melons and left us eating what we could find of the ones that had been dropped then all we six with our melons got on old yank and went home we also used to hitch old yank into the wagon and get wood but one sad day in the fall the yankees came back again and gathered up their old stock and took old yank away one day mistress sent me out to do some churning under a tree i went to sleep and jerked the churn over on top of me and consequently got a whipping my mother came for us at the end of the year 1865 and demanded that her children be given up to her this mistress refused to do and threatened to set the dogs on my mother if she did not at once leave the place my mother went away and remained with some of the neighbors until supper time then she got a boy to tell caroline to come down to the fence when she came my mother told her to go back and get henry and myself and bring us down to the gap in the fence as quick as she could then my mother took henry in her arms and my sister carried me on her back we climbed fences and crossed fields and after several hours came to a little hut which my mother had secured on a plantation we had no more than reached the place and made a little fire when master's two sons rode up and demanded that the children be returned my mother refused to give us up upon her offering to go with them to the yankee headquarters to find out if it were really true that all the negroes had been made free the young men left and troubled us no more the cabin that was now our home was made of logs it had one door and an opening in one wall with an inside shutter was the only window the door was fastened with a latch our beds were some straw there were six in our little family my mother caroline henry two other children that my mother had brought with her upon her return and myself the man on whose plantation this cabin stood hired my mother as cook and gave us this little home we children used to sell blueberries and plums that we picked one day a man on whom we depended for our home and support left then my mother did washing by the day for whatever she could get we were sent to get cold victuals from hotels and such places a man wanting hands to pick cotton my brother henry and i were set to help in this work we had to go to the cotton field very early every morning for this work we received forty cents for every hundred pounds of cotton we picked caroline was hired out to take care of a baby in 1866 another man hired the plantation on which our hut stood and we moved into clayton to a little house my mother secured there a rich lady came to our house one day looking for someone to take care of her little daughter i was taken and adopted into this family this rich lady was mrs e m williams a music teacher the wife of a lawyer we called her ms mary some rich people in clayton who had owned slaves opened the methodist church on sundays and began the work of teaching the negroes my new mistress sent me to sunday school every sunday morning and i soon got so i could read miss mary taught me every day at her knee i soon could read nicely and went through sterling's second reader and then into mcguthrie's third reader the first piece of poetry i recited in sunday school was taught to me by miss mary during the week miss mary's father-in-law an ex-judge of clayton alabama heard me recite it and thought it was wonderful it was this i am glad to see you little bird it was your sweet song i heard what was it i heard you say give me crumbs to eat today here are crumbs i brought for you eat your dinner eat away come and see us every day after this miss mary kept on with my studies and taught me to write as i grew older she taught me to cook and how to do housework during this time miss mary had given my mother one dollar a month in return for my services now as i grew up to young womanhood i thought i would like a little money of my own accordingly miss mary began to pay me four dollars a month besides giving me my board and clothes for two summers she let me out while she was away and i got five dollars a month while i was with miss mary i had my first sweetheart one of the young fellows who attended sunday school with me miss mary however objected to the young man's coming to the house to call because she did not think i was old enough to have a sweetheart 
i owe a great deal to miss mary for her good training of me in honesty uprightness and truthfulness she told me that when i went out into the world all white folks would not treat me as she had but that i must not feel bad about it but just do what i was employed to do and if i wasn't satisfied to go elsewhere but always to carry an honest name one sunday when my sweetheart walked to the gate with me Miss Mary met me and told him she thought I was too young for him and that she was sending me to Sunday school to learn not to catch a bow. It was a long while before he could see me again, not until later in the season, in watermelon time, when Miss Mary and my mother gave me permission to go to a watermelon party one Sunday afternoon. Miss Mary did not know, however, that my sweetheart had planned to escort me. We met around the corner of the house, and after the party he left me at the same place. After that, I saw him occasionally at barbecues and parties. I was permitted to go with him some evenings to church, but my mother always walked ahead or behind me and the young man. We went together for four years. During that time, although I still call Miss Mary's my home, I had been out to service in one or two families. Finally, my mother and Miss Mary consented to our marriage, and the wedding day was to be in May. The winter before that May, I went to service in the family of Dr. Drury in Euphalia. Just a week before I left Clayton, I dreamed that my sweetheart died suddenly. The night before I was to leave, we were invited out to tea. He told me he had bought a nice piece of poplar wood with which to make a table for our new home. When I told him my dream, he said, Don't let that trouble you. There is nothing in dreams. But one month from that day he died, and his coffin was made from the piece of poplar wood he had bought for the table. After his death, I remained in Clayton for two or three weeks with my people, and then went back to Euphalia, where I stayed two years. My sweetheart's death made a profound impression on me, and I began to pray as best I could. Often I remained all night on my knees. Going on an excursion to Macon, Georgia one time, I liked the place so well that I did not go back to Euphalia. I got a place as cook in the family of an Episcopal clergyman and remained with them eight years, leaving when the family moved to New Orleans. During these eight years, my mother died in Clayton, and I had to take the three smallest children into my care. My oldest sister was now married and had a son. I now went to live with Mrs. Maria Campbell, a colored woman who adopted me and gave me her name. Mrs. Campbell did washing and ironing for her living. While living with her, I went six months to Lewis High School in Macon. Then I went to Atlanta and obtained a place as a first-class cook with Mr. E. N. Inman, but I always considered Mrs. Campbell's my home. I remained about a year with Mr. Inman and received as wages $10 a month. One day when the family were visiting in Memphis, I chanced to pick up a newspaper and read the advertisement of a northern family for a cook to go to Boston. I went at once to the address given and made agreement to take the place, but told the people that I could not leave my present position until Mr. Inman returned home. Mr. and Mrs. Inman did not want to let me go, but I made up my mind to go north. The northern family whose service I was to enter had returned to Boston before I left and had made arrangements with a friend, Mr. Bullock, to see me safely started north. After deciding to go north, I went to Macon to make arrangements with Mrs. Campbell for the care of my two sisters who lived with her. One sister was now about 13 and the other 15, both old enough to do a little for themselves. My brother was dead. He went to Brunswick in 1875 and died there of the yellow fever in 1876. One sister I brought in later years to Boston. I stayed in Macon two weeks and was in Atlanta three or four days before leaving for the north. About the 15th of June, 1879, I arrived at the old colony station in Boston and had my first glimpse of the country I had heard so much about. From Boston, I went to Newtonville, where I was to work. The gentleman whose service I was to enter, Mr. E. N. Kimball, was waiting at the station for me and drove me to his home on Warner Street. For a few days, until I got somewhat adjusted to my new circumstances, I had no work to do. On June 17th, the family took me with them to Auburndale, but in spite of the kindness of Mrs. Kimball and the colored nurse, I grew very homesick for the South and would often look in the direction of my old home and cry. The washing, a kind of work I knew nothing about, was given to me, 
but i could not do it and it was finally given over to a hired woman i had to do the ironing of the fancy clothing for mrs kimball and the children about five or six weeks after my arrival mrs kimball and the children went to the white mountains for the summer and i had more leisure mr kimball went up to the mountains every saturday night to stay with his family over sunday but he and his father-in-law were at home other nights and i had to have dinner for them to keep away the homesickness and the loneliness as much as possible i made acquaintance with the hired girl across the street one morning i climbed up into the cherry tree that grew between mr kimball's yard and the yard of his next-door neighbor mr roberts i was thinking of the south and as i picked the cherries i sang a southern song mr roberts heard me and gave me a dollar for the song by agreement mrs kimball was to give me three dollars and a half a week instead of four until the difference amounted to my fare from the south after that i was to have four dollars i had however received but little money in the fall after the family came home we had a little difficulty about my wages and i left and came into boston one of my making acquaintances had come north before me and now had a position as cook in the house on columbus avenue i looked this girl up then i went to a lodging house for colored people on kendall street and spent one night there mrs kendall had refused to give me a recommendation because she wanted me to stay with her and thought the lack of a recommendation would be an inducement in the lodging house i made acquaintance with the colored girl who took me to an intelligence office the man at the desk said he would give me a card to take to 24 Springfield Street on receipt of 50 cents. I had never heard of an office of this kind and asked a good many questions. After being assured that my money would be returned in case I did not accept the situation, I paid the 50 cents and started to find the address on the card. Being ignorant of the scheme of street numbering, I inquired of a woman whom I met where number 24 was. This woman asked me if I was looking for work and when I told her I was, she said a friend of hers on Springfield Street wanted a servant immediately. Of course, I went with this lady, and after a conference with the mistress of the house as to my ability, when I could begin work, what wages I should want, etc., I was engaged as cook at three dollars and a half a week. From this place, I proceeded to 24 Springfield Street, as directed, hoping that I would be refused, so that I might go back to the intelligence office and get my fifty cents. The lady at number 24 who wanted a servant said she didn't think I was large and strong enough and guessed I wouldn't do. Then I went and got my 50 cents. Having now obtained a situation, I sent to Mr. Kimball for my trunk. I remained in my new place a year and a half. At the end of that time, the family moved to Dorchester, and because I did not care to go out there, I left their service. From this place, I went to Narragansett Pier to work as a chambermaid for the summer. In the fall, I came back to Boston and obtained a situation with a family in Berwick Park. This family afterward moved to Jamaica Plain, and I went with them. With this family, I remained seven years. They were very kind to me, gave me two or three weeks' vacation without loss of pay. In June 1884, I went with them to their summer home in the Isles of Shoals as housekeeper for some guests who were coming from Paris. On the 6th of July, I received word that my sister Caroline had died in June. This was a great blow to me. I remained with the Reeds until they closed their summer home, but I was not able to do much work after the news of my sister's death. I wrote home to Georgia, to the white people who owned the house in which Caroline had lived, asking them to take care of her boy Lawrence until I should come in October. When we came back to Jamaica Plain in the fall, I was asked to decide what I should do in regard to this boy. Mrs. Reed wanted me to stay with her, and promised to help pay for the care of the boy in Georgia. Of course, she said, I could not expect to find positions if I had a child with me. As an inducement to remain in my present place and leave the boy in Georgia, I was promised provision for my future days as long as I should live. It did not take me long to decide what I should do. The last time I had seen my sister, a little over a year before she died, she had said when I was leaving, I don't expect ever to see you again, but if I die I shall rest peacefully in my grave, because I know you will take care of my child. I left Jamaica Plain and took a room on Village Street for the two or three weeks until my departure for the South. During this time, a lady came to the house to hire a girl for her home in Wellesley Hills. The girl who was offered the place would not go. 
i volunteered to accept the position temporarily and went at once to the beautiful farm at the end of a week a man and his wife had been engaged and i was to leave the day after their arrival these new servants however spoke very little english and i had to stay through the next week until the new ones were broken in after leaving there i started for georgia reaching there at the end of five days at five o'clock i took a carriage and drove at once to the house where lawrence was being taken care of he was playing in the yard and when he saw me leave the carriage he ran and threw his arms around my neck and cried for joy i stayed a week in this house looking after such things of my sisters as had not been already stored one day i had a headache and was lying down in the cook's room lawrence was in the dining room with the cook's little girl and the two got into a quarrel in the course of which my nephew struck the cook's child the cook in her anger chased the boy with a broom and threatened to give him a good whipping at all costs hearing the noise i came out into the yard and when lawrence saw me he ran to me for protection i interceded for him and promised he should get into no more trouble we went at once to a neighbor's house for the night the next day i got a room in the yard of a house belonging to some white people here we stayed two weeks the only return i was asked to make for the room was to weed the garden lawrence and i dug out some weeds and burned them but came so near setting fire to the place that we were told we need not dig any more weeds but that we might have the use of the room so long as we cared to stay in about a week and a half more we got together such things as we wanted to keep and take away with us the last time i saw my sister i had persuaded her to open a bank account and she had done so and had made small deposits from time to time when i came to look for the bank book i discovered that her lodger one mayfield had taken it at her death and nobody knew where it might be now i found out that mayfield had drawn thirty dollars from the account for my sister's burial and also an unknown amount for himself he had done nothing for the boy i went down to the bank and was told that mr mayfield claimed to look after my sister's burial and her affairs he had made one reuben bennett who was no relation and had no interest in the matter administrator for lawrence until his coming of age but bennett had as yet done nothing for him the book was in the bank with some of the accounts still undrawn how much i did not know i next went to see a lawyer to find out how much it would cost me to get this book the lawyer said fifteen dollars i said i would call again in the meantime i went to the courthouse and when the case on trial was adjourned i went to the judge and stated my case the judge who was slightly acquainted with my sister and me told me to have reuben bennett in court next morning at nine o'clock and to bring lawrence with me when we had all assembled before the judge he told bennett to take lawrence and go to the bank and get the money belonging to my sister bennett went and collected the money some thirty-five dollars the boy was then given into my care by the judge for his kindness the judge would accept no return happy at having obtained the money so easily we went back to our room and rested until our departure the next night for jacksonville florida i had decided to go to this place for the winter on account of lawrence thinking the northern winter would be too severe for him my youngest sister who had come to macon from atlanta a few days before my arrival did not hear of caroline's death until within a few days of our departure this youngest sister decided to go to florida with us for the winter our trunks and baggage were taken to the station in a team we had a goodly supply of food given us by our friends and by the people whose hospitality we had shared during the latter part of our stay the next morning we got into jacksonville my idea was to get a place as chambermaid at green cove springs florida through the influence of the head waiter at the hotel there whom i knew after i got into jacksonville i changed my plans i did not see how i could move my things any farther and we went to a hotel for colored people hired a room for two dollars and boarded ourselves on the food which had been given us in macon this food lasted about two weeks then i had to buy and my money was going every day and none coming in i did not know what to do one night the idea of keeping a restaurant came to me and i decided to get a little home for the three of us and then see what i could do in this line of business after a long and hard search i found a little house of two rooms where we could live and the next day i found a place to start my restaurant for house furnishings we used at first to the best advantage we could the things we had brought from macon caroline's cook stove had been left with my foster mother in macon 
after hiring the room for the restaurant i sent for this stove and it arrived in a few days then i went to a dealer in second-hand furniture and got such things as were actually needed for the house and the restaurant on the condition that he would take them back at a discount when i got through with them trade at the restaurant was very good and we got along nicely my sister got a position as nurse for fifteen dollars a month one day the cook from a shipwrecked vessel came to my restaurant and in return for his board and a bed in the place agreed to do my cooking after trade became good i changed my residence to a house of four rooms and put three cheap cots in each of two of the rooms and let the cots at a dollar a week apiece to colored men who worked nearby in hotels lawrence and i did the chamber work at night after the day's work in the restaurant i introduced boston baked beans into my restaurant much to the amusement of the people at first but after they had once eaten them it was hard to meet the demand for beans lawrence who was now about eleven years old was a great help to me he took out dinners to the cigar makers in a factory nearby at the end of the season about four months it had grown so hot that we could stay in jacksonville no longer from my restaurant and my lodgers i cleared one hundred and seventy five dollars which i put into the jacksonville bank then i took the furniture back to the dealer who fulfilled his agreement my sister decided to go back to atlanta when she got through with her place as nurse which would not be for some weeks i took seventy five dollars out of my bank account and with lawrence went to fernandina there we took train to port royal south carolina then steamer to new york from new york we went to brooklyn for a few days then we went to newport and stayed with a woman who kept a lodging house i decided to see what i could do in newport by keeping a boarding and lodging house i hired a little house and agreed to pay nine dollars a month for it i left lawrence with some neighbors while i came to boston and took some things out of storage these things i moved into the little house but i found after paying one month's rent that the house was not properly located for the business i wanted i left and with lawrence went to narragansett pier i got a place there as runner for the laundry that is i was to go to the hotels and leave cards and solicit trade then lawrence thought he would like to help by doing a little work one night when i came back from the laundry i missed him nobody had seen him all night i searched for him but did not find him in the early morning i met him coming home he said a man who kept a bowling alley had hired him at fifty cents a week to set up the pins and it was in the bowling alley he had been all night he said the man let him take a nap on his coat when he got sleepy i went at once to see this man and told him not to hire my nephew again a lady who kept a hotel offered me two dollars a week for lawrence's services in helping the cook and serving in the helps dining room when the season closed the lady who hired lawrence was very reluctant to let him go we went back to newport to see the landlady from whom i had hired the house and i paid such part of the rent as i could then i packed my things and started for boston on reaching there i kept such of my things as i needed and stored the rest and took a furnished room in about a week's time i went to see the husband of the lady for whom i had worked at wellesley hills just previous to my departure for the south he had told me to let him know when i returned to boston he said a man and his wife were at present employed at his farm but he didn't know how long they would stay before another week had passed this gentleman sent for me he said his wife wanted me to go out to the farm and that i could have lawrence with me the boy he said could help his wife with the poultry and could have a chance to go to school i was promised three dollars and a half a week and no washing to do I was told that the farm had been offered for sale and of course it might change hands any day i was promised however that i should lose nothing by the change lawrence was very lonely at the farm with no companions and used to sit and cry the place was sold about ten weeks after i went there and i came into boston to look about for a restaurant leaving lawrence at the farm when the home was broken up the owners came to the revere house boston barrels of apples potatoes and other provisions were given to me i found a little restaurant near the providence depot for sale i made arrangements at once to buy the place for thirty five dollars and the next day i brought lawrence and my things from wellesley hills i paid two dollars a week rent for my little restaurant and did very well the next spring i sold the place for fifty dollars in time to get a place at the beach for the summer lawrence got a position in a drug store and kept it four years then he went to hampton college hampton virginia 
after finishing there he came back and then went to the world's fair in chicago after that he took a position on one of the fall river line boats at the outbreak of the spanish war he enlisted in brooklyn as powder man on the battleship texas he was on the texas when the first shot was fired he was present at the decoration of the graves of the american soldiers in havana and also at the decoration of the battleship maine after she was raised after the war he came to brooklyn and got an honorable discharge then he served as valet to a rich new york man who traveled a good deal about the middle of last november nineteen o six lawrence came to boston to see me he is now in atlantic city a waiter in the royal hotel in eighteen eighty eight i was married at twenty seven pemberton street to samuel h burton by dr o p gifford after my marriage mr burton got a place in braintree as valet to an old gentleman who was slightly demented and he could not be satisfied until i joined him so i put our things into storage and went to braintree i remained there ten months and then came back to boston then i got a position as head matron in the helps dining room in a hotel at watch hill rhode island my husband was also there as waiter at the end of the season we both came home and rented a lodging house and lost money on it end of chapter one Chapter 2 of Memories of Childhood's Slavery Days by Annie L. Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michelle Fry. Reminiscences. The times changed from slavery days to freedom's days. As young as I was, my thoughts were mystified to see such wonderful changes, yet I did not know the meaning of these changing days. But days glided by, and in my mystified way I could see and hear many strange things. I would see my master and mistress in close conversation, and they seemed anxious about something that I, a child, could not know the meaning of. But as weeks went by, I began to understand. I saw all the slaves one by one disappearing from the plantation. For night and day they kept going, until there was not one to be seen. All around the plantation was left barren day after day i could run down to the gate and see down the road troops and troops of garrison's brigade and in the midst of them gangs and gangs of negro slaves who joined with the soldiers shouting dancing and clapping their hands the war was ended and from mobile bay to clayton alabama all along the road on all the plantations the slaves thought that if they joined the yankee soldiers they would be perfectly safe as i looked on these i did not know what it meant for I had never seen such a circus. The Yankee soldiers found that they had such an army of men and women and children that they had to build tents and feed them to keep them from starving. But from what I, a little child, saw and heard the older ones say, that must have been a terrible time of trouble. I heard my master and mistress talking. They said, well, I guess those Yankees had such a large family on their hands. We rather guessed those fanatics on freedom would be only too glad to send some back for their old masters to provide for them. But they never came back to our plantation, and I could only speak of my own home. But I thought to myself, what would become of my good times all over the old plantation? Oh, the harvesting times, the great hog-killing times when several hundred hogs were killed, and we children watched and got our share of the slaughter in pig's liver roasted on a bed of coals, eaten ashes and all. Then came the great sugar cane grinding time, when they were making the molasses, and we children would be hanging around, drinking the sugar cane juice, and awaiting the moment to help ourselves to every good thing. We did, too making ourselves sticky and dirty with the sweet stuff being made not only were the slave children there but the little white children from massa's house would join us and have a jolly time the negro child and the white child knew not the great chasm between their lives only that they had dainties and we had crusts my sister being the children's nurse would take them and wash their hands and put them to bed in their luxurious bedrooms while we little slaves would find what homes we could my brother and I would go to sleep on some lumber under the house, where our sister Caroline would find us and put us to bed. 
she would wipe our hands and faces and make up our beds on the floor in Moss's house for we had lived with him ever since our own mother had run away after being whipped by her mistress Later on, after the war, my mother returned and claimed us. I never knew my father, who was a white man. During these changing times, just after the war, I was trying to find out what the change would bring about for us, as we were under the care of our mistress, living in the great house. I thought this, that Henry, Caroline, and myself, Louise, would have to go as others had done, and where should we go, and what should we do? But as time went on, there were many changes. Our mistress and her two daughters, Martha and Mary, had to become their own servants and do all the work of the house, going into the kitchen, cooking and washing, and feeling very angry that all their house servants had run away to the Yankees. The time had come when our good times were over, our many leisure hours spent among the cotton fields and woods, and our half-holidays on Saturday. These were all gone. The boys had to leave school and take the runaway slaves' places to finish the planting and pick the cotton. I myself have worked in the cotton field, picking great baskets full, too heavy for me to carry. All was over. I now fully understood the change in our circumstances. Little Henry and I had no more time to sit basking ourselves in the sunshine of the sunny south. The land was empty and the servants all gone. I can see my dainty mistress coming down the steps saying, Riet, you and Henry will have to go and pick up some chips, for Miss Mary and myself have to prepare the breakfast. You children will have to learn to work. Do you understand me, Rit and Henry? Yes, Missus, we understand. And away we flew, laughing and thinking it was a great joke that we, Moss's pets, must learn to work. But it was a sad, sad change on the old plantation, and the beautiful, proud, sunny south, with its masters and mistresses, was bowed beneath the sin brought about by slavery. It was a terrible blow to the owners of plantations and slaves, and their children would feel it more than they, for they had been reared to be waited upon by willing or unwilling slaves. In this place I will insert a poem my young mistress taught me, for she was always reading poems and good stories. But first I will record a talk I heard between my master and mistress. They were sitting in the dining room, and we children were standing around the table. My mistress said, I suppose, as Nancy has never returned, we had better keep Henry, Caroline, and Louise until they are of age. Yes, we will, said Massa, Miss Mary, and Miss Martha. But it is man proposes and God disposes. So in the following pages you will read the sequel to my childhood life in the sunny south. Right after the war, when my mother had got settled in her hut, with her little brood hovered around her, from which she had been so long absent, we had nothing to eat and nothing to sleep on save some old pieces of horse blankets and hay that the soldiers gave us. The first day in the hut was a rainy day, and as night drew near it grew more fierce, and we children had gathered some little faggots to make a fire by the time mother came, with something for us to eat, such as she had gathered through the day. It was only cornmeal and peas and ham bone and skins which she had for our supper. She had started a little fire and said, Some of you close that door, for it was cold. She swung the pot over the fire and filled it with the peas and ham bone and skins. Then she seated her little brood around the fire on the pieces of blanket, where we watched with all our eyes, our hearts filled with desire, looking to see what she would do next. She took down an old broken earthen bowl, and tossed into it the little meal she had brought, stirring it up with water, making a hoe-cake. She said, One of you draw that griddle out here, and she placed it on a few little coals. Perhaps this griddle you have never seen, or one like it. I will describe it to you. The griddle was a round piece of iron, quite thick, having three legs. It might have been made in a blacksmith's shop, for I have never seen one like it before or since. It was placed upon the coals, and with an old iron spoon she put on this griddle half of the cornmeal she had mixed up. She said, I will put a tin plate over this, and put it away for your breakfast. We five children were eagerly watching the pot boiling, with the peas and ham bone. The rain was pattering on the roof of the hut. All at once there came a knock at the door. My mother answered the knock. When she opened the door, there stood a white woman and three little children, all dripping with the rain. My mother said, In the name of the Lord, where are you going on such a night with these children? 
the woman said auntie i am traveling will you please let me stop here tonight out of the rain with my children the mother said yes honey i ain't got much but what i have got i will share with you god bless you they all came in we children looked in wonder at what had come but my mother scattered her own little brood and made a place for the forlorn wanderers she said wait honey let me turn over that hoe cake then the two women fell to talking each telling a tale of woe after a time my mother called out here you louise or some one of you put some faggots under the pot so these peas can get done we couldn't put them under fast enough first one and then another of us children the mother still talking soon my mother said draw that hoe cake one side i guess it is done my mother said to the woman honey ain't you got no husband she said no my husband got killed in the war my mother replied well my husband died right after the war we have been away from my little brood for four years with a hard struggle i have got them away from the farren plantation for they did not want to let them go but i got them i was determined to have them but they would not let me have them if they could have kept them with god's help i will keep them from starving the white folks are good to me they give me work and i know with god's help i can get along the white woman replied yes auntie my husband left me on a rich man's plantation this man promised to look out for me until my husband came home but he got killed in the war and the yankees have set his negroes free and he said he could not help me any more and we would have to do the best we could for ourselves i gave my things to a woman to keep for me until i could find my kinfolk they live about fifty miles from here up in the country i am on my way there now my mother said how long will it take you to get there about three days if it don't rain my mother said ain't you got some way to ride there no auntie there is no way of riding up where my folks live the place where i am from we hoped the talk was most ended for we were anxiously watching that pot pretty soon my mother seemed to realize our existence she exclaimed my lord i suppose the little children are nearly starved are those peas done young uns she turned and said to the white woman have you all had anything to eat we stopped at a house about dinner time but the woman didn't have anything but some bread and buttermilk the mother said well honey i ain't got but a little but i will divide with you the woman said thank you auntie you just give my children a little i can do without it then came the dividing we all watched with our eyes to see what the shares would be my mother broke a mouthful of bread and put it on each of the tin plates then she took the old spoon and equally divided the pea soup we children were seated around the fire with some little wooden spoons but the wooden spoons didn't quite go round and some of us had to eat with our fingers our share of the meal however was so small that we were as hungry when we finished as when we began my mother said take that rag and wipe your face and hands and give it to the others and let them use it too put those plates upon the table we immediately obeyed orders and took our seats again around the fire one of you go and pull that straw out of the corner and get ready to go to bed we all lay down on the straw the white children with us and my mother covered us over with the blanket we were soon in the land of nod forgetting our empty stomachs the two mothers still continued to talk sitting down upon the only seats a couple of blocks a little back against the wall my mother and the white woman slept bright and early in the morning we were called up and the rest of the hoe cake was eaten for breakfast with a little meat some coffee sweetened with molasses the little wanderers and their mother shared our meal and then they started again on their journey towards their home among their kinfolks and we never saw them again my mother said god bless you i wish you all good luck I hope you will reach your home safely then mother said to us you young uns put away that straw and sweep up the place because i have to go to my work but she came at noon and brought us a nice dinner more satisfactory than the supper and breakfast we had had we children were delighted that there were no little white children to share our meal this time in time my older sister caroline and myself got work among good people where we soon forgot all the hard times in the little log cabin by the roadside in clayton alabama up to my womanhood even to this day these memories fill my mind some kind friend's eyes may see these pages and may they recall some fond memories of their happy childhood as what i have written brings back my young life in the great sunny south 
i am something of the type of moses on this forty-ninth birthday not that i am wrapped in luxuries but that my thoughts are wrapped in luxuries of the heavenly life in store for me when my life work is done and my friends shall be blessed by the work i shall have done for god has commanded me to write this book that some one may read and receive comfort and courage to do what god commands them to do god bless every soul who shall read this true life story of one born in slavery it is now six years since the inspiration to write this book came to me in the franklin evening school i have struggled on helped by friends god said write the book and i will help you and he has it was through a letter of my life that the principal of the franklin school said write the book and i will help you but he died before the next term and i worked on on this my forty-ninth birthday i can say i believe that this book is close to a finish my life is like the summer rose that opens to the morning sky but ere the shades of evening close is scattered on the ground to die yet on the rose's humble bed the sweetest dews of night are shed as if she wept a tear for me as if she wept the waste to see my life is like the autumn leaf that trembles in the moon's pale ray its hold is frail its date is brief restless and soon to pass away yet ere that leaf shall fall and fade the parent tree will mourn its shade the winds bewail the leafless tree but none shall breathe a sigh from me my life is like the prince which feet have left on tampa's desert strand soon as the rising tide shall beat all trace will vanish from the sand yet as if grieving to efface all vestige of the human race on that lone shore loud moans the sea but none alas shall mourn for me end of chapter two chapter three of memories of childhood's slavery days by annie l burton this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by michelle fry a vision there remains to be told the story of my conversion and how i came to write the foregoing history of my life in 1875 i was taken sick i thought i was going to die and i promised the lord i would serve him if he would only spare my life when i got well again however i forgot all about my promise then i was taken sick again it seemed i had to go through a dark desert place where great demons stood on either side in the distance i could just see a dim light and i tried to get to this light but could not reach it then i found myself in a great marsh and was sinking i threw up my hands and said lord if thou wilt raise me from this pit i will never fail to serve thee then it seemed as if i mounted on wings into the air and all the demons that stood about made a great roaring my fight ended on top of a hill but i was troubled because i could not find the light all at once at the sound of a loud peal of thunder the earth opened and i fell down into the pits of hell again i prayed to god to save me from this and again i promised to serve him my prayer was answered and i was able to fly out of the pit onto a bank at the foot of the little hill on which i sat there were some children and they called to me to come down but i could not get down then the children raised a ladder for me and i came down among them a little cherub took me by the hand and led me in the river of bajid of jordan i looked at my ankles and shoulders and discovered i had little wings on the river was a ship the children the cherub and i got into the ship when we reached a beautiful spot the little cherub made the ship fast and there opened before us pearly gates and we all passed through into the golden street the street led to the throne of god about which we marched then the cherub conducted us to a table where a feast was prepared then the children vanished the cherub took me by the hand and said go back into the world and tell the saints and sinners what a savior you have found and if you prove faithful i will take you to heaven to live forever when i come again when i recovered from my sickness i was baptized by the reverend dr pope and joined the church in macon when i came north i brought my letter not finding any church for colored people i came among the white people and was treated so kindly that i became very much attached to them the first church i became connected with in the north was in newtonville 
when i came to boston i went to the warren avenue baptist church before my marriage i joined tremont temple when dr lorimar was its pastor when the church was burned my letter was destroyed but when i went south on a visit i had the letter duplicated and took it to the new temple i am still a member of the temple and hope to remain there as long as god gives me life five years ago i began to go to franklin evening school mr guild was the master at one time he requested all the pupils to write the story of their lives and he considered my composition so interesting he said he thought if i could work it up and enlarge upon it i could write a book he promised to help me my teacher was miss emerson and she was interested in me but the next year miss emerson gave up teaching and mr guild died in each of the terms that i have attended i have received the certificates showing that i have been regular and punctual in attendance have maintained good deportment and shown general proficiency in the studies i would have graduated in 1907 had it not been for sickness the following was to have been my graduation composition end of chapter three Chapter 4 of Memories of Childhood's Slavery Days by Annie L. Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michelle Fry. Abraham Lincoln, an Essay. In a little clearing in the backwoods of Harding County, Kentucky, there stood years ago a rude cabin within whose walls Abraham Lincoln passed his childhood. An unaccountable man, he has been called and the adjective was well chosen for who could account for a mind and nature like lincoln's with the ancestry he owned his father was a thriftless idle carpenter scarcely supporting his family and with but the poorest living his mother was an uneducated woman but must have been of an entirely different nature for she was able to impress upon her boy a love of learning during her life his chief in fact his only book was the bible and in this he learned to read just before he was nine years old the father brought his family across the ohio river into illinois and there in the unfloored log cabin minus windows and doors abraham lived and grew it was during this time that the mother died and in a short time the shiftless father with his family drifted back to the old home and here found another for his children in one who was a friend of earlier days this woman was of a thrifty nature and her energy made him floor the cabin hang doors and open up windows she was fond of the children and cared for them tenderly and to her the boy abraham owed many pleasant hours as he grew older his love for knowledge increased and he obtained whatever books he could studying by the firelight and once walking six miles for an english grammar after he read it he walked the six miles to return it he needed the book no longer for with this as with his small collection of books what he once read was his he absorbed the books he read during these early years he did odd jobs for the neighbors even at this age his gift of storytelling was a notable one as well as his sterling honesty his first knowledge of slavery in all its horrors came to him when he was about 21 years old he had made a trip to new orleans and there in the old slave market he saw an auction his face paled and his spirits rose in revolt at the coarse jest of the auctioneer and there he registered a vow with himself if ever i have a chance to strike against slavery i will strike and strike hard to this end he worked and for this he paid the last full measure of devotion his political life began with a defeat for the illinois legislature in eighteen thirty but he was returned in eighteen thirty four eighteen thirty six eighteen thirty eight and declined re-election in eighteen forty preferring to study law and prepare for his future honest abe he has been called and throughout illinois that characteristic was the prominent one known for him for this time his rise was rapid sent to the congress of the nation he seldom spoke but when he did his terse though simple expression always won him a hearing his simplicity and frankness was deceptive to the political leaders and from its very fearlessness often defeated them his famous debates with senator douglas the little giant spread his reputation from one end of the country to the other and at their close there was no question as to lincoln's position in the north or on the vital question of the day 
the spirit of forbearance he carried with him to the white house with malice towards none and charity for all this was the spirit that carried him through the four awful years of the war the martyr's crown hovered over him from the outset the martyr's spirit was always his the burden of the war always rested on his shoulders the fathers sons and brothers the honored dead of gettysburg of antietam all lay upon his mighty heart he never forgot his home friends and when occasionally one dropped in on him the door was always open they frequently had tea in the good old-fashioned way and then lincoln listened to the news of the village old stories were retold new ones told and the old friendships cemented by new bonds then came the end swift and sudden the gloom settled upon the country for in spite of ancestry self-education ungainly figure ill-fitting clothes the soul of the man had conquered even the stubborn south while the cold-blooded north was stricken to the heart the noblest one of all had been taken end of chapter four chapter five of memories of childhood's slavery days by annie l burton this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Race Question in America by Dr. P. Thomas Stanford, author of The Tragedy of the Negro in America. As a member of the Negro race, I myself have suffered as a child whose parents were born in slavery, deprived of all influences of the ennobling life made obedient to the will of the white man by the lash and chain and sold to the highest bidder when there was no more use for them the first negro fact for white thought is that my clients the colored people here in america are not responsible for being here any more than they are responsible for their conditions of ignorance and poverty they suddenly emerge from their prison poorhouse without a home without food or clothing and ignorant now the enemies of god and of the progress of civilization in our country are today introducing a system of slavery with which they hope to again enslave the colored people to carry out their evil designs they retain able politicians lawyers and newspapers to represent them such as senator tillman the honorable john temple graves of georgia and the baltimore sun and they are trying the negro on four counts which allege that the race is ignorant cannot be taught is lazy and immoral now are the negroes as a whole guilty of these charges in the first place the negro race of america is not ignorant in the year 1833 john c calhoun senator from south carolina is reported to have said that if he could find a single negro who understood the greek syntax he would believe the negro was human and would treat him as such at that time it was a very safe test God accepted the challenge in behalf of the Negro race and inspired his white sons and daughters both in North and South to teach their brothers in black and a few years afterwards black men were examined and the world pronounced them scholars while later still the schools were using a Greek grammar written by a black man W. S. Scarborough of Wilberforce O. In his class were Frederick Douglass, Henry Highland Garnet, Robert Elliott, the Rev. J. C. Price, and John M. Langston as defenders of the race. Bishop Allen Payne, Bishop Hood, and John B. Reaver will ever be remembered for their godly piety and Christian example, as we shall also remember Bishop, Sumner, and Beauvoir for their great literary productions, William Washington Brown as the greatest organizer and financier of the century, Professor Booker Washington as the greatest industrial educator of the world, and last but not least, Thomas Condon, the greatest crank for the spiritual training and higher education of the Negro race. Under the leadership of such men, assisted by our white friends and backed up by our colored race journals, the Christian Banner of Philadelphia, the Christian Recorder, the Star of Zion, and the Afro-American Ledger of Baltimore, Indiana, the National Baptist Union of Pennsylvania, the Age of New York, the Christian Organizer of Virginia, and the Guardian of Boston, our onward march to civilization is phenomenal, and by these means we have reduced illiteracy 50%. In the South, we have over $12 million worth of school property, 3,000 teachers, 50 high schools, 17 academies, 
hundred and twenty-five colleges ten law and medical schools twenty-five theological seminaries all doing a mighty work for god and humanity now as to laziness we have now in practice fourteen thousand lawyers and doctors and have accumulated over a hundred and fifty million dollars worth of church property in the south we have over a hundred and fifty thousand farms and houses valued at nine hundred million dollars and personal property at a hundred and seventy million dollars we have raised over eleven million dollars for educational purposes the property per capita for every colored man woman and child in the united states is estimated at seventy five dollars and we are operating successfully several banks and factories we have seven million five hundred thousand acres of land and the business activity of the colored people was never as thoroughly aroused as it is today when i come to deal with the charge of immorality i bow my head and blush for shame first because if the charge be true i see they are getting like the white man every day i know that at the close of the american civil war the four million negroes had more than twenty five percent of the white blood coursing through their veins what about this new educated negro just ask the pullman car company which employs hundreds of negroes into whose care thousands of women and children of our best american families are entrusted every day now you cannot do without the negro because if you send him away you will run after him he is here to stay the only way to deal successfully with the colored race is god's way first recognize that he is your guest second recognize that you have robbed him of his birthplace home family and savings it is these facts that are causing so much unrest on the part of the whites in this country the negro loves his country which he has proved beyond a doubt in every american battle in every act of loyalty to his country and in his long and patient suffering pay him what you owe him by educating him give him an opportunity to live allow him to live in decent parts of your city pay wages sufficient to support his children do this and god will remove the objectionable negro from the land the negro stands today upon the eminence that overlooks more than two decades spent in efforts to ameliorate the condition of seven million immortal souls by opening before their hitherto dark and cheerless lives possibilities of development into a perfect and symmetrical manhood and womanhood the retrospect presents to us a picture of a people's moral degradation and mental gloom caused by slavery which reduced them to objects of charity and surrounded them with difficulties which have ever stood as impregnable barriers in their way to speedy advancement in all those qualities that make the useful citizen every influence of state and society life seems to be against their progress and like some evil genius these negro hating ghosts are forever hunting them with the idea that their future must be one of subserviency to the white race hated and oppressed by the combined wisdom wealth and statesmanship of a mighty confederacy who watched and criticized their mistakes which were strongly magnified by those who fain would write destruction upon the emancipation they are expected to rise from this condition the idea of giving to the newly enfranchised a sound practical education was considered at the dawn of freedom an easy solution of what as an unsolved problem threatened the perpetuity of republican institutions within a year from the firing on sumter benevolent and far-sighted northern friends had established schools from washington to the gulf of mexico which became centers of light penetrating the darkness and scattering the blessings of an enlightened manhood far and wide the history of the world cannot produce a more affecting spectacle than the growth of this mighty christian philanthropy which beginning amid the din of battle has steadily marched on through every opposing influence and lifted a race from weakness to strength from poverty to wealth from moral and intellectual non-entity to place and power among the nations of the earth we have ten millions of colored people in the united states whose condition is much better today than it was fifty years ago then he had nothing not even a name Today he has 160,000 farms under good cultivation and valued at $4 million, and has personal property valued at $200 million. 
in the southland the negroes own 160 first-class drug stores nine banks 13 building associations and 100 insurance and benefit companies two street railways and an electric at jacksonville florida which they started some years ago when the white people passed the jim crow law for that state now it is reckoned that the negroes in the united states are paying about 700 million dollars property taxes and this is only one-fifth of all they have accumulated for the negro is getting more like the white people every day and has learned from him that it is not a sign of loyalty and patriotism to publish his property at its full taxable value in education and morals progress is still greater as you all know at the close of the war the whole race was practically illiterate it was a rare thing indeed to find a man of the race who even knew his letters in 1880 the illiteracy had fallen to 70 percent and rapid strides along that line have been made ever since today there are 37,000 negro teachers in america of which number 23,000 are regular graduates of high and normal schools and colleges 23 are college presidents 169 are principals of seminaries and many are principals of higher institutions at present there are 369 negro men and women taking courses in the universities of europe the negro ministry together with these teachers have been prepared for their work by our schools and are the greatest factors the north has produced for the uplift of the colored man today there are those who wish to impede the negro's progress and lessen his educational advantages by industrializing such colleges as howard university of washington by placing on their board of trustees and managers the pronounced leaders of industrialism giving as a reason that the better he is educated the worse he is in other words they say crime has increased among educated negroes while stern facts show the opposite the exact figures from the last census show that the greater proportion of the Negro criminals are from the illiterate class. Today, the marriage vow, which by the teaching of the whites the Negro held to be of so little importance before the war, is guarded more sacredly. The one-room cabin, with its attendant evils, is passing away, and the Negro woman, the mightiest moral factor in the life of her people, is beginning to be more careful in her deportment and is no longer the easy victim of the unlicensed passion of certain white men. This is a great gain and is a sign of real progress, for no race can rise higher than its own women. Let me plead with the friends of the Negro. Please continue to give him higher ideals of a better life and stand by him in the struggle he has done well with the opportunities given him and is doing something along all the walks of life to help himself which is gratitude of the best sort what he needs today is moral sympathy which in his condition years ago he could hardly appreciate the sympathy must be moral not necessarily social it must be the sympathy of a soul set on fire for righteousness and fair play in a republic like ours a sympathy which will see to it that every man shall have a man's chance in all the affairs of this great nation which boasts of being the land of the free and the home of the brave for which the black man has suffered and done so much in every sense of the word let this great christian nation of eighty millions of people do justice to the black battalion and seeing president roosevelt acknowledges that he overstepped the bounds of his power in discharging and renouncing them before they had a fair trial and now that they are vindicated before the world to take back what he called them cutthroats brutal murderers black midnight assassins and cowards this and this alone will to some extent atone for the wrong he has done and help him regain the respect and the confidence of the world now in order to change the condition of things i would suggest first that an international industrial association be formed to help afro-americans to engage in manufacturing and commercial pursuits assist them to buy farms erect factories open shops in which their young men and women can enter and produce what the world requires every day for its inhabitants if they were able today to produce the articles in common use as boots shoes hats cotton and woolen goods made up clothing and enterprises such as farming mining forging carpentering etc negroes would find a ready sale in preference to all others because of its being a race enterprise doing what no other corporation does 
giving employment to members of the race as tradesmen and teaching others to become skilled workers these enterprises should be started in the southern northern and western states where the negro population will warrant such an undertaking i would suggest a school history of the negro race to be placed in our public schools as a textbook the general tone of all the histories taught in our public schools points to the inferiority of the negro and the superiority of the white it must be indeed a stimulus to any people to be able to refer to their ancestry as distinguished in deeds of valor and particularly so to the colored people with what eyes can the white child look upon the colored child and the colored child look upon himself when they have completed the assigned course of united states history and in it found not one word of credit not one word of favorable comment for even one among the millions of his foreparents who have lived through nearly three centuries of this country's history in them he is credited with no heritage of valor he is mentioned only as a slave while true historical records prove him to have been among the bravest of soldiers and a faithful producer of the nation's wealth though then a slave to the government the negroes was the first bloodshed in its defense in those days when a foreign foe threatened its destruction in each and all of the american wars the negro was faithful yes faithful in battle while members of his race were being lynched to death faithful to a land not his own in points of rights and freedom all and that after he had enriched with his own life's blood shouldered his musket to defend when all this was done regarded him with renewed terms black negro last but not least the negro needs a daily newspaper in every large city managed and edited by members of the race such papers are needed to deal with the questions of state and reflect the thought of the social world to enter the province of ethics and tread the domain of morals and to give their opinion on the varying phases of religious truths and pass judgment on matters of a political nature these are hidden wrongs perpetrated by the whites against the negro race that will never be brought to light until the race owns and controls its own daily newspapers which alone have the power to discover and enthrone truth thus becoming a safe guide to all honest seekers of facts respecting the race whether from a moral educational political or religious field to carry out the plans suggested whether viewed from an intellectual industrial commercial or editorial standpoint the world must acknowledge that today the negro race has the men and women who are true to their race and all that stands for negro progress end of chapter five chapter six of memories of childhood's slavery days by annie l burton this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Historical Composition It is only 132 years ago today that the British troops who had occupied Boston made a riding school of the Old South Church and otherwise sacrilegiously disported themselves, were persuaded to get out under the compulsion of the batteries set up on Dorchester Heights. But when the last company embarked for Halifax, it carried the last British flag ever unfurled by a military organization on Massachusetts soil. That was the end of foreign domination in Massachusetts. And by a happy coincidence, this is the legendary anniversary of the birth of St. Patrick, the patron saint of Ireland, whose memory has been an inspiration in the struggle of another race for liberty. A Question of Ethics New York, December 17th. Andrew Carnegie declared yesterday in a speech on the Negro question that the Negroes are a blessing to America and that their presence in the South makes this country impregnable and without need of a navy to defend itself. Suppose, said Mr. Carnegie, Great Britain were to send her war fleets to America. It would amount to nothing. All that the President of the United States would have to do would be to say, Stop exporting cotton. The war would be ended in four days, for England cannot do without our cotton. We don't need a navy. We are impregnable. Because we have nine million colored men anxious and willing to work, we hold this strong position, and I am interested in the Negro from this material standpoint as well as from the more humane point of view. End of chapter 6 
Chapter 7 of Memories of Childhood's Slavery Days by Annie L. Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My Favorite Poems. Verses. On a green slope, most fragrant with the spring, one sweet fair day I planted a red rose that grew beneath my tender nourishing so tall so riotous of bloom that those who passed the little valley where it grew smiled at its beauty all the air was sweet about it still i tended it and knew that he would come even as it grew complete and the day brought him up i led him where in the warm sun my rose bloomed gloriously smiling and saying lo is it not fair and all for thee all thine but he passed by coldly and answered rose i see no rose leaving me standing in the barren vale alone alone feeling the darkness close deep o'er my heart and all my being fail then came one gently yet with eager tread begging one rosebud but my rose was dead verses the old old wind that whispers to old trees round the dark country when the sun has set goes murmuring still of unremembered seas and cities of the dead that men forget an old blind beggar man disdained and gray with ancient tales to tell mumbling of this and that upon his way strange song and muttered spell neither to east or west or south or north his habitation lies this roofless vagabond who wanders forth i under alien skies a gypsy of the air he comes and goes between the tall trees and the shadowed grass and what he tells only the twilight knows the tall trees and the twilight hear him pass to him the dead stretch forth their strengthless hands he who campaigns in other climes than this he who is free of the unshapen lands the empty homes of dis verses out of the scattered fragments of castles i built in the air i gathered enough together to fashion a cottage with care thoughtfully slowly i planned it and little by little it grew perfect in form and in substance because i designed it for you the castles that time has shattered gleamed spotless and pearly white as they stood in the misty distance that borders the land of delight sleeping and waking i saw them grow brighter and fairer each day but alas at the touch of a finger they trembled and crumbled away then out of the dust i gathered a bit of untarnished gold and a gem unharmed by contact with stones of a baser mold for sometimes a priceless jewel gleams wondrously pure and fair from glittering paste foundations of castles we see in the air so i turned from the realms of fancy as remote as the stars above and into the land of the living i carried the jewel of love the mansions of dazzling brightness have crumbled away it is true but firm upon gold foundations stands the cottage I built for you. Verses You do but jest, sir, and you jest not well. How could the hand be enemy of the arm? Or seed and sod be rivals? How could light feel jealousy of heat? Plant of the leaf? Or competition dwell twixt lip and smile? Are we not part and parcel of yourselves? like strands in one great braid we intertwine and make the perfect whole you could not be unless we gave you birth we are the soil from which you sprang yet sterile were that soil save as you planted though in the book we read one woman bore a child with no man's aid we find no record of a man-child born without the aid of woman fatherhood is but a small achievement at the best while motherhood is heaven and hell this ever-growing argument of sex is most unseemly and devoid of sense why waste more time in controversy when there is not time enough for all of love our rightful occupation in this life why prate of our defects of where we fail 
when just the story of our own worth would need eternity for telling and our best development comes ever through your praise as through our praise you reach your highest self oh had you not been miser of your praise and let our virtues be their own reward the old established order of the world would never have been changed small blame is ours for this unsexing of ourselves and worse effeminizing of the male we were content sir till you starved us heart and brain all we have done or wise or otherwise traced to the root was done for love of you let us taboo all vain comparisons and go forth as god meant us hand in hand companions mates and comrades evermore two parts of one divinely ordained whole verses a widow had two sons and one knelt at her knees and sought to give her joy and toiled to give her ease he heard his country's call and longed to go to die if god so willed but saw her tears and heard her sigh a widow had two sons one filled her days with care and creased her brow and brought her many a whitened hair his country called he went nor thought to say good-bye and recklessly he fought and died as heroes die a widow had two sons one fell as heroes fall and one remained and toiled and gave to her his all she watched her hero's grave in dismal days and fair and told the world her love her heart was buried there our mission in the legends of the norsemen stories quaint and weird and wild there's a strange and thrilling story of a mother and her child and that child so runs the story in those quaint old norseman books fell one day from dangerous playground dashed in pieces on the rocks but with gentle hand that mother gathered every tender part bore them gently torn and bleeding on her loving mother heart and within her humble dwelling strong in faith and brave of soul with her love song low and tender rocked and sang the fragments whole such the mission of the christian taught by christ so long ago this the mark that bids us stay not this the spirit each should know rent and torn by sin the race is heart from heart and soul from soul this our task with christ's sweet love song join and heal and make them whole reverend e m bartlett verses lord over all whose power the scepter swayed ere first creation's wondrous form was framed when by his will divine all things were made then king almighty was his name proclaimed when all shall cease the universe be o'er in awful greatness he alone will reign who was who is and who will evermore in glory most refulgent still remain sole god unequaled and beyond compare without division or associate without commencing date or final year omnipotent he reigns in awful state he is my god my living savior he my sheltering rock in sad misfortune's hour my standard refuge portion still shall be my lot's disposer when i seek his power into his hands my spirit i consign whilst wrapped in sleep that i again may wake and with my soul my body i resign the lord's with me no fears my soul can shake the creation by annie l burton the earth the firmament on high with all the blue ethereal sky were made by god's creative power six thousand years ago or more man too was formed to till the ground birds beasts and fish to move around the fish to swim the birds to fly and all to praise the love most high this world is round wise men declare and hung on nothing in the air the moon around the earth doth run the earth moves on its center too the earth and moon around the sun as wheels and tops and pulleys do water and land make up the whole from east to west from pole to pole vast mountains rear their lofty heads rivers roll down their sandy beds and all join in one grand acclaim to praise the lord's almighty name end of chapter seven
Chapter 8 of Memories of Childhood's Slavery Days by Annie L. Burton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My Favorite Hymns. Hymn The Ninety and Nine. There were ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold, but one was out on the hills away far off from the gates of gold away on the mountains lone and bare away from the tender shepherd's care lord thou hast here thy ninety and nine are they not enough for thee but the shepherd made answer this of mine has wandered away from me and although the road be rough and steep i go to the desert to find my sheep but none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed nor how dark was the night that the lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost out in the desert he heard the cry sick and helpless and ready to die lord whence are those blood drops all the way that mark out the mountain's track they were shed for one who had gone astray ere the shepherd could bring him back lord whence are thy hands so rent and torn they are pierced to-night by many a thorn but all through the mountains thunder riven and up from the rocky steep there arose a glad cry to the height of heaven rejoice i have found my sheep and the angels echoed around the throne rejoice for the lord brings back his own him my faith looks up to thee my faith looks up to thee thou lamb of calvary saviour divine now hear me while I pray, take all my guilt away. O oh, let me from this day be wholly thine. May thy rich grace impart strength to my fainting heart, my zeal inspire. As thou hast died for me, O oh, may my love to thee, pure, warm, and changeless be, a living fire. When ends life's transient dream, when death's cold, sullen stream shall o'er me roll, Blessed Saviour, then in love, fear and distrust remove, O oh, bear me safe above, a ransomed soul. Him, Jordan's Strand My days are gliding swiftly by, and I, a pilgrim stranger, would not detain them as they fly those hours of toil and danger. Chorus For, O oh, we stand on Jordan's strand, our friends are passing over, and just before the shining shore we may almost discover. We'll gird our loins, my brethren dear, our heavenly home discerning. Our absent Lord has left us word, let every lamp be burning. Should coming days be cold and dark, we need not cease our singing. That perfect rest naught can molest, where golden harps are ringing. Let sorrow's rudest tempest blow, each cord on earth to sever. Our King says, Come, and there's our home, forever, oh, forever. Him over the line oh tender and sweet was the master's voice as he lovingly called to me come over the line it is only a step i am waiting my child for thee refrain over the line hear the sweet refrain angels are chanting the heavenly strain over the line why should i remain with a step between me and jesus but my sins are many my faith is small lo the answer came quick and clear Thou needst not trust in thyself at all. Step over the line, I am here. But my flesh is weak, I tearfully said, and the way I cannot see. I fear if I try I may sadly fail, and thus may dishonor thee. Ah, the world is cold, and I cannot go back. Press forward I surely must. I will place my hand in his wounded palm. Step over the line and trust him oh could i speak the matchless worth oh could i speak the matchless worth oh could i sound the glories forth which in my saviour shine i'd soar and touch the heavenly strings and vie with gabriel while he sings in notes almost divine i'd sing the precious blood he spilt my ransom from the dreadful guilt of sin and wrath divine I'd sing his glorious righteousness, in which all perfect heavenly dress my soul shall ever shine. I'd sing the characters he bears, and all the forms of love he wears, exalted on his throne. 
in loftiest songs of sweetest praise i would to everlasting days make all his glories known well the delightful day will come when my dear lord will bring me home and i shall see his face then with my saviour brother friend a blessed eternity i'll spend triumphant in his grace him o god beneath thy guiding hand o god beneath thy guiding hand our exiled fathers crossed the sea and when they trod the wintry strand with prayer and psalm they worshipped thee thou heardst well pleased the song the prayer thy blessing came and still its power shall onward through its ages bear the memory of that holy hour laws freedom truth and faith in god came with those exiles o'er the waves and where their pilgrim feet have trod the god they trusted guard their graves and here thy name o god of love their children's children shall adore till these eternal hills remove and spring adorns the earth no more him america my country tis of thee sweet land of liberty of thee i sing land where my fathers died land of the pilgrim's pride from every mountain side let freedom ring my native country thee land of the noble free thy name i love i love thy rocks and rills thy woods and templed hills my heart with rapture thrills like that above let music swell the breeze and ring from all the trees sweet freedom's song let mortal tongues awake let all that breathe partake let rocks their silence break the sound prolong our father's god to thee author of liberty to thee we sing long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light protect us with thy might great god our king him in the cross of christ i glory in the cross of christ i glory towering o'er the wrecks of time all the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime when the woes of life o'ertake me hopes deceive and fears annoy never shall the cross forsake me lo it glows with peace and joy when the sun of bliss is beaming light and love upon my way from the cross the radiance streaming add more luster to the day Bane and blessing, pain and pleasure, by the cross are sanctified. Peace is there that knows no measure, joys that through all time abide. Him, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more open now the crystal fountain whence the healing waters flow let the fiery cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through strong deliverer be thou still my strength and shield when i tread the verge of jordan bid my anxious fears subside bear me through the swelling current land me safe on canaan's side songs of praises i will ever give to thee Hymn christ receiveth sinful men sinners jesus will receive sound this word of grace to all who the heavenly pathway leave all who linger all who fall chorus sing it o'er and o'er again christ receiveth sinful men make the message clear and plain christ receiveth sinful men come and he will give you rest trust him for his word is plain he will take the sinfulest Christ receiveth sinful men. Christ receiveth sinful men, even me with all my sin. Purged from every spot and stain, heaven with him I enter in. Him, some day the silver cord will break. Some day the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing. But oh, the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the king. And I shall see him face to face, and tell the story, saved by grace. Some day my earthly house will fall. I cannot tell how soon twill be, but this I know, my all in all, has now a place in heaven for me. Some day till then I'll watch and wait, my lamp all trimmed and burning bright, that when my Saviour opes the gate, my soul to him may take its flight. Him, Battle Hymn of the Republic 
mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the lord he is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored he hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword his truth is marching on i have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps they have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps i can read his righteous sentence in the dim and flaring lamps his day is marching on i have read the fiery gospel writ in burnished rows of steel as ye deal with my contemners so with you my grace shall deal let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his heel since god is marching on he has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never sound retreat he is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat oh be swift my soul to answer him be jubilant my feet our god is marching on in the beauty of the lilies christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me as he died to make men holy let us die to make men free while god is marching on end of chapter eight end of memories of childhood's slavery days